And this is BBC One, now later than you may have been expecting. Patrick Moore with The Sky at Night. Good evening. We've been hearing a great deal about an asteroid, 2002 NT7, which was said might collide with the Earth. I can assure you it won't. We're quite safe. On the other hand, what are asteroids? Well, they aren't miniature worlds, tennis of debris, and most of them stay well out beyond the path of Mars, many millions of miles away. The small ones can come close to us and could conceivably hit. Welcome to the sky at night, Dr. Duncan Steele. Duncan, welcome. Thank you, Patrick. Of course, uh, you're an asteroid observer and hunter, and we've heard so much recently about asteroid 2002 NT7 that might be on a collision course. What's the latest news? Yes, well, the good news is, very good news is, it's not going to hit. It's going to miss. It certainly isn't going to hit the Earth at any time within the next century. So this is one we don't need to worry about anymore. We'll keep tabs on it, obviously, but we are certain now that that asteroid is not going to hit the Earth at any time within the time scale of interest to, to us our children, and right the way through to our great-grandchildren. What's the missed distance when it goes by? Well, it's going to miss by a good large distance. We thought there was a chance that it might come back and hit us in 2060, even after 2019 had been, uh, it had been possible to show that that wasn't the case. 2060, it's going to come back and indeed pass close, a few times further away than the moon, but really it's going to miss by a good safe distance, so it isn't a dangerous one. It's one that we've actually been able to say, hey, we know that one, we'll keep it in the data banks, we'll keep tabs on it, but we know it's going to miss. How many asteroids are there now numbered? Well, numbered means we've got a well-determined mm. orbit for them, and yeah. it's around about 40,000, but yeah. really every week it's going up, every <laughs> month is going up, it's phenomenal right now. But the amazing thing is that only uh, about 10,000 of those currently have names, so 30,000 of them waiting to be named as such, they've just got their numbers. But if we leave those aside, the ones which have well-determined orbits, the ones which just have preliminary designations, only been observed for a short length of time, there are actually hundreds of thousands of those. But we're not running out. There are actually yeah. millions of them out there, billions out in the asteroid belt, so we're not going to run out soon. We certainly aren't. Well, asteroids come in two main types, stones and ions. That's correct. Um, in fact, we can tell the, the same sort of classifications by looking through telescopes. Some asteroids show a reflectivity, or a color, I should say, which are diagnostic of them being metallic just like some meteorites are. Others are, st are indeed stony, and they show a certain characteristic color. Another interesting thing is that some asteroids actually contain a great deal of carbon materials, the sort of things which are essential for the origin and evolution of life. We call those carbonaceous chondrites. Actually, they're very, very dark. They're almost black, but not quite black. They're more brownish. And in fact, we find that as we go outwards through the solar system, further from the sun, we see more and more of asteroids like that reflect very little of the light which hits them from the sun, only three or four percent. That makes them especially difficult to spot. So the most interesting ones as such are the most difficult ones to discover. And they're very odd shapes sometimes. Yeah, all sorts of different shapes. There's one out in the main belt which is called Cleopatra, spelt with a K actually. And it's shaped just exactly like a dog's bone, only it's a hundred miles odd long. So it's a huge thing. In fact, we've, I've also got one here which is shaped somewhat like a potato. This is an Earth approaching asteroid called Tutatis. Yeah. It was uh, discovered, uh, I believe, by a, a French group that's a model which is built up using radar data. It also behaves very peculiarly in that asteroids don't just move through space without spinning. They, they spin usually about one axis, and we can measure how fast they spin from looking at how the intensity of the light from them goes up and down. But Dutatis does something somewhat different. It actually tumbles, just like it's kind of rolling along. So it's actually spinning, if you like, over multiple axes, not just around one polar axis. Of course, that's a consequence of it being a very odd shape. If it was uh, spherical, I guess it would spin just like a planet does, but it isn't, and so it does do all these very strange things. What type of asteroid was NT7? Well, we don't know what type it is. So far, nobody's actually made any physical observations of it, which means taking a look at its color and this sort of thing. Hopefully that will occur over the next several years. It's quite big, though, isn't it? It's quite big. We know how big it is, at least we can guess how big it is, from how bright it is. But again, it really is only a guess. If it's actually a very dark asteroid, so it reflects very little light, obviously that means it's going to be bigger than our present estimate, which says it's about a mile and a, mile and a half, something of that sort of an order. Uh, however, some asteroids, like Vesta out in the main belt, reflect a great deal of light, reflect about 40% of the sunlight which hits them. And if 
2002 NT7 is light, that and actually it might be somewhat smaller. It may only be half a mile across. Well, the point is here, of course, that some of these things come straight out of the sun, so to speak. Yes, again, people get a little bit mystified by what we're up to here. The name of the game is predicting an impact a long way ahead of time. If we spotted one which was going to hit us, let's say, in a day or a week, there's essentially nothing we could do about it. To which extent, not being able to see them coming out of the sun is not actually a problem, as long as we spot them as they go by. The odds are in our favour that there won't be one coming directly to hit us from out of the sun, but it's possible. Unfortunately, at the present time, with the current search programmes, there's no way in which we're going to see one of those things. And we have had major impact before. I mean, there's a well-supported theory that there was a major impact by an asteroid 65 million years ago, and it wiped out the dinosaurs. Yeah, obviously the, the dinosaurs being extinguished by a massive asteroid impact 65 million years ago is the one which people most identify with. They know about it. Kids are excited about dinosaurs, and, and that actually creates a lot of good, good vibes, if you like. However, there have been many other big impacts which have caused mass extinction events, and many more smaller impacts which have actually caused large numbers of deaths of animals. Even within recorded history, we believe we've got evidence for significant impacts occurring. Obviously nothing which has caused global effects, otherwise we wouldn't be here to talk about it. But at least some thousands of people being killed by different small asteroid impacts over the last several thousand years. It has happened in the past. It certainly will happen again in the future unless we do something about it. What do you reckon is the minimum size of an asteroid to cause real damage? It's an amazing thing because, of course, the atmosphere is just made of air, so if you like, it's very soft. But when you run into the atmosphere at such extreme speeds as these things do, like 20 miles per second, uh, the atmosphere a acts as a fantastic barrier. For the asteroid, it's like running into a brick wall. It's an astonishing thing that an asteroid, a lump of rock, even 100 yards across, is unlikely to reach the ground intact. It will explode in the atmosphere. It won't leave a crater, which means that the evidence quite often is lacking. The famous uh, event which occurred in 1908 over Siberia was a lump of rock 50 or 60 yards across. It did not reach the ground, so there is no crater. But we do see the devastation which it caused when it blew up at an altitude of about four miles. So what's the minimum size which can cause any yes. damage? Oh, 50 or 60 yards certainly is big enough to take out a city. Good news is, of course, that the next one most likely will not come in over a city. But nevertheless, it's something we need to take ser seriously because the consequences are so horrendous. If we saw an asteroid, say, half a mile across, coming towards us on a collision course, is there anything we can do about it? Mm. Well, no, no, obvious, no, no point in breaking it up. No, no point in breaking it up. We always say it's like changing a cannonball into a shotgun blast. You still get hit by all the pellets. Um, we need to give it a nudge, a little nudge, just to get it to miss the Earth. Now, we don't yet know definitively how to do that. We've never tried doing it, but we believe we do have the technology. Various uh, suggestions have been made to do with putting rockets on board to give it a little shove and this sort of thing. But really, that's very much in the, s the field of kind of uh, looking very much into the future. The first thing we need to do is know much more about our enemy. What are they made of? How strong are they? And this sort of thing. The best idea is not a very comfortable idea. It involves using a nuclear weapon in order to move it off course. But let me tell you, it's not like in the movies, Deep Impact and Armageddon and this sort of thing. That's very much science fiction. Uh, paradoxically, we need to use a nuclear weapon in a gentle way. That is possible. By having a standoff explosion, it is possible to irradiate one surface of an asteroid, we believe, and cause some of the surface to evaporate. As it evaporates, it's a kind of jetting force, which is gently shoving it in one direction. And in that way, we believe it would be possible to push one off course by sufficient to get it to miss the Earth. Now, that's the theory. Okay, the practice may be entirely different, but indeed the sums do show that it should be possible. We believe we've got the technological capability. What we also need is the warning time. That's the essential yes. thing. We need many years of warning. Again, it's not like the movies where we see one coming and we blast it out of the sky. That's entirely science fiction. We need to have many years of warning time in order that the small nudge that we give it continues to propagate forward to end up with it actually missing the Earth. In fact, it's possible that just by changing its speed by one inch per second, so a very, very small speed, if you did that, say, 20 years ahead of time, that would be sufficient to get it to miss the Earth, as long as we did it properly. We've got to have enough warning. Time is all important. Are we doing enough about it, do you think? We have our space guard, run by J. Tate. We're certainly not doing enough at the present time. In essence, all of the big search programs are carried out in the United States, and there are actually five separate programs and they are very, very prolific. They are finding Earth-crossing asteroids now at a rate of more than one per night on average. 
400 of them last year. So you can see there's still hundreds of them, thousands of them out there waiting to be discovered. Unfortunately, very few other countries are doing anything. Japan has a small search program, but to date, Britain has actually done nothing. So although there's a lot of talking done in this country, in terms of real action and using British telescopes spread around the world, it just isn't being done. And we've certainly got to do much, much more than we are as a global effort. It has to be an international effort. What people need to understand is no matter where a half mile or one mile, mile asteroid hits the Earth, everybody's in big trouble. So it has to be a, an international effort. People have talked about maybe it's a job for the United Nations. Well, I don't know who should be in charge of it, but certainly it has to be a global program. All nations which have some capability to assist with this need to be involved. If we found a very small asteroid, very hard to work at an active orbit for several years ahead. Yes, the essence of the problem is that when you observe an asteroid out in space, it can be millions of miles mm -hmm. away, and so in fact your knowledge of its position, when you take a picture of the background stars and so on with the asteroid in the foreground, your knowledge of its position can be many thousands of miles out just due to random, random uncertainties. It's the same as saying to somebody, well, how tall are you? Somebody might say, well, I'm f five foot eight and a half, but somebody else might measure them actually being five foot nine, half an inch difference. Well, converting that to what actually happens up there in, in, the, in the skies, it can convert into a thousands of miles uncertainty in the position of the asteroid. Uh, so that's a problem. And the way around that actually is to keep making measurements. We need measurements over a very long time frame. With enough of those, in the end, it is possible to narrow down our knowledge of precisely it's where, it, where it's going to go. But it does take time. That's why we have these alerts every so often in the mass media where people get panic-stricken because they think this asteroid is going to hit uh, and the media can make a big thing of it. But in fact, what happens is over the course of time, we narrow down it, its orbit and then we can say for sure, hey, you know, unfortunately we've got a problem here or in almost every case we actually are able to prove no, it's definitely going to miss. But that does take weeks to months of tracking, sometimes even years. What do you reckon the chances are of a major impact within 500 years or so? If we take as long a time frame as 500 years, it comes out to be quite significant. The Tunguska event over Siberia in 1908, uh, it's argued about how often that happens. Some people would say it's once every 50 years on average. Some people would say, no, it's once every 300 years. We don't have enough data to say for sure. But if you're going to take a 500-year time span, then something like that should happen maybe a few times, maybe 10 times over that sort of time frame. However, those again only cause regional damage. Certainly it would cause a great deal of upset, and indeed if it was catastrophically to happen over a city, it would potentially leave millions of people dead. But that is unlikely. In fact, it does turn out that you are more likely to die due to an asteroid bigger than half a mile in size hitting the Earth. I always say it's like road accidents, you know. Very few people are killed by cyclists cycling into them. Very few people are killed by very big impacts by a fully loaded cement mixer, for example, running them over. Most people die in tragic road accidents due to cars. It's the things in between. The same is true for asteroids. Very, very big ones, like the asteroid which wiped out the dinosaurs. That's a very unlikely event. Much more frequent are the smaller ones, which only cause regional damage. But the ones which are most likely to get you, so it says on your gravestone you died due to an asteroid hitting the Earth, happen to be ones about half to one mile in size. That sort of ballpark. Those occur on the average about once every 100,000 years, according to both astronomical data, that is, we can look out and see how many there are out there, but also we can look at the craters on the moon and on the Earth and work out how often our, our satellite, our moon, and the Earth have been hit in the past by these things, and from that work out an average rate. So if it's once every 100,000 years, that means there's a 1 in 100,000 chance every year that an event like that would happen. Now look, let's hope that such a thing doesn't happen because really it would be catastrophic. We're looking there at a quarter to a half of all humankind being killed. But again, the odds are in our favor, but we can make the odds much, much better if we find all these objects and show, hey, none of them is going to hit the Earth. If we do show that that's the case, there isn't one due to hit the Earth for the next 100 years or the next 500 years, then in fact, we'll then know that the chance is much, much smaller even than this one in 100,000. There's a famous story that um, a dog was killed by a falling meteorite. Well, I think that's been discounted now. But there's no definite proof of anyone having been killed by one. No, it's a really difficult thing. Certainly people have been hit by oh, meteorites. Yes. And there have been two occasions during the last century when a cow has been killed, it happens. But then cows stand out in the fields, and I guess they're quite a, a relatively big target compared to a person. Um, but meteorites themselves as such are not dangerous. It's very, very unlikely that a small rock will land on your head. It happens that they are slowed down by the atmosphere, and then they fall at the same speed at which a rock dropped out of an airplane would hit the ground. 
The ones which are dangerous are the much bigger rocks which come penetrating through the atmosphere at their cosmic speeds, and that's tens of miles per second. And when they hit the ground, they don't just fall and leave a small hole, they leave a horrendous hole. So, for example, the crater which a lot of people know of, Meteor Crater in Arizona, formed 49,000 years ago. It's about three quarters of a mile across, but it was formed by a solid lump of nickel iron hitting the ground at a cosmic velocity, and the size of that was hardly bigger than your house. It was about 30 meters across, 30 yards across. So quite a small cosmic projectile left this huge crater. Typically, the craters are 10 to 20 times bigger than the size of the object which formed them. They have a great deal of energy, hit the ground, they explode with a huge explosion. Meteor crater is equivalent to about a 15 to 20 megaton nuclear bomb. If we are hit, I hope we'll cope better than the dinosaurs did. A little while ago, in a program, I said a question, what is Cygnus X1? And the answer is, it's an X-ray source, certainly powered by a massive black hole. And we did a program with Professor Stephen Hawking, and he said a question, who should I explain my theories to and why? And he picked a winner, and the winner was uh, Stephen Arnold from Nottinghamshire, and the character was Homer Simpson. And so, Stephen, a copy of Hawking's book and a copy of my new Sky at Night book, they're on their way to you. Now, don't forget our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash space, or CFAX page 620. So, Duncan, you're an asteroid hunter. What did you feel when you discovered your first asteroid? Well, obviously, it was very exciting, although I've got to say it wasn't immediately obvious. I knew it was an asteroid, but always when you find these things on photographic plates, you can never be sure, is this one which has previously been known? And so then what one does is one checks through the data banks. One realizes, hey, that one there, nobody's ever seen that before. It isn't in the data banks. That then, it does become tremendously exciting because you're the first person ever to see it. It's like discovering a new land, if you like. Come over a range of mountains and you see a new vista before you. You know that you're the first person ever to see that. It's the same with discovering asteroids, or indeed any of these things out in the solar system. And of course, you are in the end entitled to name it. That's correct. Sometimes people say you get the naming rights. That isn't quite true, because there are certain rules as to what you can't name them for. For example, people who are politicians, you can't name them for. You can't name them for people who are best known for military exploits either. But within certain parameters, you are indeed allowed to put forward a name. It's considered by an international group, an international committee, and nearly all the time, your name that you've suggested will be accepted. I served on that committee for a long, long time. I think important to know if an asteroid are named, stars are not. And there are various agencies that claim to name stars on payment of some money, but have nothing to do with that. Stars just, stars just get numbers and, and designations. Asteroids are things which, actually, if you discover a comet, it gets your name. You have no choice. But if you discover an asteroid, it's not the done thing to name it for yourself. Uh, what you would tend to do is name it for uh, somebody you know or some some place you, you, you identify with. For example, there's one named for the little town I come from in Somerset called Midsummer Norton. It was one of the ones I found. Equally well, my two sons and my wife are very pleased they've got asteroids named for them. It, uh, it keeps uh, things a little bit quieter at home. Duncan, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. When I come back next month, we're going to pay a visit to George Bank, home of the great 250-foot Lovell radio telescope. Until then, good night.